The reality is that everyone has an opinion about Jesus and what Jesus is all about. You have an opinion, everyone around you has an opinion about Jesus and what Jesus is all about. Now, you might not have ever given much thought to that opinion, but we all have one. In fact, it would be almost impossible to meet someone today who had never heard of Jesus. Almost impossible to meet someone who, did, who didn't have some opinion about him and, and what he was about. Your professor has an opinion about Jesus, and they'll let you know. Your coworkers have an opinion. Media has an opinion about Jesus. Politicians have an opinion about Jesus and what he was all about. Celebrities have an opinion. Atheists have an opinion about Jesus. Your grandmother has an opinion. You're like, dear Lord, do I know my grandmother has an opinion about Jesus and what he was all about. Here's my point. Here's my point. My point is that there's a lot of noise out there and a lot of voices who will be more than willing to share their opinions for good or for bad about who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. And the core burden behind this series, the reason we want to talk about things we're going to talk about these next few weeks is that so oftentimes we make up our own minds about who Jesus is based on the opinions and actions of others. And we never really go straight to the source. We never really go to Jesus himself and let him speak for himself in his own words about who he is and what he came to do. And, I, and I'll tell you what breaks my heart. This, this gets me, man. This, this breaks my heart. The reality is that some of you, you've formed negative opinions about anything associated with Jesus and his church. Because years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago for some of you, you bumped into people who claimed to be his followers, but they were just downright mean. They were hateful. Or you, you ran into people who claimed to be as far as, and yet they took advantage of your innocence and they broke your trust. And you decided then, all those years ago, you decided then that if that's what Jesus and Christianity was all about. You don't want any of it. And see, you thought you were walking away from Christ. But you were just walking away from Christians. And it's not the same thing. And listen, if I were to hear your story, or the people around you right now were to hear your story, man, none of us would blame you for doing that. And maybe you're back today and you're just beginning to dip your toes back into this whole thing, but it's a lot for you to do that. And the reason why I feel so burdened for that is because the reality is that some of you, you are stuck now. You're stuck with an opinion of Jesus that isn't rooted in anything remotely resembling who Jesus actually claimed to be. And so we're just going to let, these next few weeks, we're going to let Jesus speak for himself. We're going to let him speak for himself. It's not your professor, not your parents, not those people who hurt you 10 years ago. We're going to explore who Jesus is and who he claimed to be in his own words. And I'm telling you, you might be surprised by what you find. In fact, there was one eyewitness to the life of Jesus. His name was John. A lot of people think John was maybe around the age of 14, 15, 16 years old, a high school student. When Jesus first saw him and invited John to follow him, and John did begin to follow him, and John documented in detail, as an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, he documented in detail what he saw Jesus do and what he heard Jesus say. And in John's account, which you can read, everybody can read it, in John's account of Jesus' life, we see multiple times that Jesus didn't pull any punches. He just kind of flat out, side, said, you know, flat out said a few times, he said, okay, you want to know who I am? You want to know what I'm all about? Here's who I am. I'll tell you. And a few times he just makes it crystal clear. And over these next few weeks, we're, we're going to look at some of those statements that John recorded that Jesus made about himself and what it means for us today. And here's the first one. Here's how we're getting out of the gate for this whole series. This is the first statement that Jesus made. This is Jesus in his own words. It's right here. Jesus said, you want to know who I am? I am the bread of life. That's kind of weird. So let's talk about it. I am the bread of life. Anybody hungry right now, by the way? Anybody hungry? Just seeing the word bread made you hungry. You know, I, 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 don't, know, um, I don't know if you've ever made a bad decision because Jesus said, I, I am the bread of life. Some of us are like, my stomach's growling, man. Right? I, have you ever made a, a bad decision when you're hungry? You ever made a bad decision while hungry? Man, I make, all, I make all sorts of regrettable decisions while I'm hungry. I make bad financial decisions when I'm hungry. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the grocery store hungry and regretted it. I'm like, yeah, I need four of those packs of Oreos, right? I need multiple gallons of ice cream right now. I'm just telling you, it's a very different experience going to the grocery store on a full stomach than an empty one. The receipt is a lot longer on an empty stomach. I make bad health decisions when I'm hungry. Guys, I got to tell you this. The other day, I, I was starving. 
Yeah, I mean, of course, that's like the American version. Like, I hadn't eaten in two hours. I was starving. <laughs> and we had all of our staff in. We have about 300, we have almost 300 staff who work here at the church, and um, they are amazing. They are, I think, the best staff in the country. And so we take it real seriously to just pour into them. And so we bring them in multiple times a year, everybody from all across the state, um, and we just pour into their professional and spiritual development. And so we did this last week. And when we're all together, we also just have a ton of fun. And so um, we were kind of celebrating everything we've seen God do over this summer. And one of the things that we do in the summer is at the movies. And so kind of in theme with that, we gave all of our staff and, and their families a huge, when they walked out, they had this huge, you know those huge tubs? They're not even buckets. Tubs of popcorn you can get at the movie theater. Like they should be illegal. You know what I mean? They cost $55. But anyways, you, you know what I'm saying. We gave them one of those and we, and we filled it up with candy and popcorn and all sorts of movies. And then we gave them a, a pass like to a free movie night for their family. Um, and, and so, but the best part about it was at the end, it was like, hey, dig, everybody dig to the bottom. So this was in everybody's bucket. Everybody dug to the bottom and everybody pulled out a golden ticket, kind of like Willy Wonka, right? Everybody, everybody had one. And that golden ticket was an additional day of vacation that we gave everybody this year and just said, well, you can take it at any point, any way that you want to use it. We just want um, to, you to know, man, we are so grateful for the work God's doing through our staff. And so it was a good day. That's my point. It was a good day. So you're clapping because you know our staff is amazing. They clap too. I'm just saying. Um, so anyways, Jenny and I, we we're, were walking back to my office afterwards, and I was hungry. And I saw one of those buckets. I don't know whose it was. I don't know. But I grabbed some candy out of that bucket. And I didn't grab a bag of Reese's Pieces. I grabbed a box a big box. You ever seen those big boxes? I grab one of those, and without even thinking, Jenny and I are talking, I just open up, I start doing this. Mm-hmm, yep, yeah, I know, I know. Four minutes goes by, and after about four minutes, I do this. It's gone. The box, gone. Do you know how many serving sizes were in that box? More than one, I'm just saying. <laughs> And listen, we've all, you're judging me right now, but we have all had some moment, haven't we, where we probably did not make the best choice because we were hungry and we just wanted our appetites filled at the moment. And one of the things you're going to see in these coming weeks in this series is that Jesus oftentimes, he took the common everyday experiences of life like hunger and bread and he used those images to drive home much deeper spiritual truths about who he is and what he came to do in our lives. And this moment where Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, man, it was a perfect setting because he had at that moment where he said, I'm the bread of life, he had in front of him a bunch of hungry people standing around him the very first time he ever made that statement. I'll give you a little bit of context real quick. There, there was this particular day that Jesus had been speaking for a large part of the day and people from all over the region had had walked in from everywhere to begin to listen to Jesus. And so he kept talking, they kept coming. He kept talking, they kept coming. He kept talking, they kept coming. Until finally, there were literally thousands of people surrounding him. The, 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 the scriptures recorded there were 5,000 men. So it could have been 15, 20,000 people. They were everywhere. And it was getting late in the day and the people needed to be fed. They were truly hungry. And of course, there's no really, you know, no real easy solutions in the first century to this, except Jesus is on the scene. And he does something absolutely remarkable in this moment. He takes this little boy's small lunch with a couple of pieces of bread and fish, and he multiplies it. I like to think of like fish, the first fish tacos, right? It's bread and fish. I mean, kind of whatever. Anyways, we'll move on. But he takes this, and he multiplies it, fish tacos for everybody, and he keeps multiplying it and multiplying it and multiplying from this one little lunch. And Jesus' followers start to distribute this food. They start giving it out and giving it out to thousands of people in this small lunch that should have been able to feed just one or two people is multiplied by Jesus to the point where thousands of people are fed and full. They even had leftovers. And so this hungry crowd of thousands all have full stomachs now on someone else's dime. That's the best kind of meal, isn't it? A free one. So what do you think happened to Jesus's favorability ratings with the crowd that day? So the polls tell us it went up. Oh, it skyrocketed, man. They liked him. They like Jesus, and they especially like this. Ooh, I like this, Jesus. You're a good guy. And then nighttime falls, and Jesus and his disciples, see, they were 
on this one side of the lake, there was a sea called the Sea of Galilee. It's about seven miles wide, and their home was on the other side of the lake. And so they decided that night to row back across to where their home was. And so the next morning, the people wake up, and their stomachs are growling. It's breakfast time. And you know their first thought was, whew, hey, where's Jesus? Jesus, Jesus, where are you? And they realize he's not there. That he had crossed over to the other side of the lake. But a man's got to eat, come on. So they hop in some boats and they go to find him. Listen to what it says, this is in John chapter six. It says, they found him. They finally get to him. They found him on the other side of the lake and they asked him, they said, Rabbi, that just means teacher. That's the way they referred to him. They said, Rabbi, Jesus, Huh. when did you get here? Like they're surprised. Any of you guys have a kid, by the way, that thinks they're sly? You know what I mean? They just, you, but you can tell immediately when they're angling for something. You know what I mean? They come downstairs, they're like, oh, dad, I didn't know you'd be here where you are every night in your favorite chair. And then they start asking you questions about your life. Like they're suddenly interested in things they've never been interested in. Like, hey, how's that project at work been going? Let me ask you, what is your first instinctive, no one had to teach you this, what is the very first thought that goes through your mind? What do you want? Just tell me now. Let's not waste time. I gotta get back to this game. They come across the lake, they're like, oh, Jesus, wow, fancy this, you're over here. We didn't know, when did you get here? Jesus doesn't even bother asking what they want, because he already knows. I love this. Jesus goes straight to the point. Jesus replied, I'll tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. He's like, look, guys, I'm not stupid. I know why you're here. You want breakfast. And Jesus calls them out on something here. He says, you, you know what I am? I love this. He's like, you know what I am to you? I'll tell you what I am to you. I'm just a big cosmic divine MTO at sheets for you. That's what I am. Let me translate for all of you at the Harleysville location right now. Jesus is saying, I'm just a heavenly hoagie fest at Wawa to you. That's all. <laughs> See, now you're tracking. All right. He's saying, look, I, I'm no better. I'm no better than convenience store. I'm just a free meal. That's how you see me. I'm a free meal. But, but I actually want you to hear for a second the heartache that must be behind this statement. Listen to what he said. He said, you want to be with me because I fed you. He's saying, you, you don't want me. You just want my stuff. Guys, that, that is deflating to a relationship, isn't it? In fact, I, I, I would argue that it's impossible to have an authentic, growing relationship with anyone from whom you're always just trying to get something. You can't really have an authentic relationship with them, can you? Why? Because everything will be measured. There's always an angle. It's not really a relationship. It's a transaction. And Jesus is calling this out, and I'm telling you, it rings as true to today as it did all those years ago by the lake. Jesus did not step into this world, and he did not give his life on the cross so that he could be a cosmic MTO for us. The invitation that he makes to you, the invitation that he makes to me, is to follow him and trust him for who he is, not for what he can give us. He's not a meal ticket. And yet, it's so easy to treat him that way. I, I know I slip into that. It's like we, we do this. We're like, hey, Jesus, I prayed. You told me to pray. I prayed. Why didn't it happen? Where's my bread? Jesus, I started tithing. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Jesus, I started going back to church. Doesn't that count for something? Jesus, I stopped lying. I did the right thing. Where's my bread? I need my bread. And Jesus is saying, man, as long as you think of me that way, and you treat me that way, you'll never experience me for who I am. You will not know me. He's saying that if you're, if you're just coming to me to get something, some material need met, you're going to miss the much deeper work I want to do in your life. In fact, listen to what he says next. The very next words out of his mouth. He says, don't, don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. But spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me this seal of his approval. He's like, do you understand what I can truly do for your life? 
He tells them, look, look, you, you came here looking for me to do another miracle, to make more of this bread right here, this kind of bread that's perishable, that, that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow, that's bread that's going to go stale at some point. Yeah, he's saying it can, it can sustain physical life for a little bit, but there's another kind of life that I want to breathe into you. He's saying, you're so worried about the physical hunger getting met, but there's a greater hunger that I've come to fulfill. Guys, just just listen to this. There are cravings and there are appetites and there are hungers that you and I have. I'm not talking physical ones. I'm talking eternal. Kinds of hungers that come from a much deeper place that we long to get fulfilled. There are some fundamental hungers inside of every single one of us right now that we will be driven to great lengths to get those hungers satisfied. It goes for every single one of us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your first time here, your 90th time here. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter where you come from, your background. We all have these hungers. I'm talking soul hungers inside of us. We, every single one of us has a hunger inside of us to have meaning and purpose in this life. You can't shake it. To know that we're not an accident. You yearn for that. You long for that. You're hungry for that. To know that you're not just floating around aimlessly in this life. Every single one of us has a hunger to be loved and accepted and chosen. Some of you, 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 this hunger has driven you. You know this. You've spent so much energy trying to gain the approval and acceptance from others because you want that hunger satisfied. Some of you, you've spent years of your life trying to prove to your dad that he can be proud of you. Why do we do that? Why can't we just shake that kind of stuff? Why can't we just say, oh, that's just childhood kind of stuff? Because there are hungers in your soul. They're deeper than any physical needs you have. And Jesus is saying, these are eternal longings. The reason you can't shake them, you're longing for meaning, you're longing to be loved and chosen, is because these are eternal longings placed there by an eternal God who created you to ultimately drive you back to him. So he can fulfill those longings for you. But what we so often do is we look to perishable, that's what Jesus said, perishable, temporary things to fill the hunger in our soul. Some of you know, if you've been around for a little bit, you you know that I I was actually born in Birmingham, Alabama. And whenever I say Alabama, I go back there, Alabama. So anyways, even after we moved from there when I was a little kid, it, it, Birmingham was always kind of home base for us. You know, all the holidays, all my summers were spent there. And, and over the last couple of years, now, last two years, I, I've actually had an opportunity to go down back to Birmingham a few times. And, and each time I've gone down, I have made sure to take the people that I'm traveling with to one of my favorite restaurants in the entire city called Batola. Love this place. A few years ago, um, a few years ago, I was at a, a gathering and I actually met the owner and the head chef uh, at Patola. Man, we just hit it off. Love this guy. I learned that uh, his name is James, and James had actually been named one of the country's best new chefs by Food and Wine. Um, he was actually a semifinalist for a James Beard Award, and those are all just real foodie ways of saying he's legit, and his restaurant's amazing. And every time I've taken people to Batola these last few years, there's one thing they always talk about. Everything's amazing there. Everything's great. The atmosphere, the entrees, everything. But the thing everybody talks about is the bread. I got any bread people here today? Anybody, any bread people? Just embrace it. Just take it. You know what I mean? Like gluten, bring it on. We just want all the gluten. (laughs) I'm a fan of gluten. But I'm telling you, man, that bread is some of the best I've ever had. And they take it serious at Batola. I mean, they take it real serious. They bake that bread daily, fresh daily with naturally fermented dough. They use caputo flour that is flown in directly from Italy. I have no clue what that means. You don't either. But if I were to take you there, here's what I know. You might not know what caputo flour is from Italy, but you will be like, that's the best bread I think I've ever had. And you will thank me for the rest of your life if I were to take you there with me. Actually, let's just imagine that for a second. Let's just imagine I did take you and we were able to go and we sit down and we're looking over the menu and our server comes up, takes our drink order, and then they ask the all important question. Would you like us to, would you like us to bring some bread out for you? And you've heard about this bread or like, oh, I cannot wait. But before you can respond, I jump in and say, we won't need any. I actually brought these. And the server's like, "Uh, sir, 
Are you sure? Because see, we use Caputo flour flown in from Italy. And I say, oh, Caputo flour? Well, these actually have wheat flour along with niacin, reduced iron, and a healthy dose of thiamine mononitrate. I practice a week saying that, by the way. <laughs> so I say, so you know what? We won't need any. You know what you would do? You would take me by the shoulders and you would say, why? Why are you settling for crackers when you could have the bread? We settle for crackers all the time, don't we? Crackers to feed our soul. We convince ourselves that our hunger for meaning and love, because it's not going away, it's there. And we just convince ourselves that that will finally be satisfied once we prove our worth. Once we get the promotion, that'll do it. Once we get the recognition, once we get the accolades, once we make all state, once we get into that school, once we make partner, once we get the girl, once we get the guy. And you know what? Here's the thing, we finally get those things and our stomachs stop growling for a little while, but the hunger comes back, doesn't it? Because it's crackers, it's crackers. And see, some of you know this because you got the girl, you got the guy, you got the kids, you got the job, you got the house, you got the recognition, you got the thing that you convinced yourself you could not live without, you got it, but in the end, the hunger came back. And it's not that any of those things are bad, None of those are bad. It's not that anything, those things are wrong. It's when we place our hope in non-eternal things to fulfill eternal longings that our souls will starve. They will starve. And Jesus is saying that anything you look for to bring you life outside of me will eventually leave you hungry again. It's all crackers. There's another kind of bread that will not leave you empty. There's another kind of bread that will never go stale, another kind of bread that is eternal in nature. And Jesus is saying, that is what I'm offering. And he says it that day to those first listeners all those years ago, and they don't get it. The very first people who heard it, they don't get it. In fact, they kind of at this moment are like, hold up, hold up, eternal, eternal bread. You mean there's a bread that never runs out? Woo! we we'll never have to go hungry again. This is what they say. They go, well, sir, in that case, give us that bread every day. <laughs> now, I like to imagine snarky Jesus. It's not in the New Testament, but I just kind of read between the lines every now and then. And see, my snarky Jesus filter is on right here, like after they said this, that maybe just for a moment, they say, give us that bread every day. Jesus is like, are you, are you serious? You still think we're talking about physical bread? I'm using it as a metaphor. But I also think he was heartbroken. Because this is how Jesus replied to this. Jesus replied, guys, I am the bread. It's me. I'm the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me. Even though you've seen me, I'm standing right here. The bread. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. That soul hunger, that craving for meaning and purpose in life, that hunger to be fully known and fully loved, Jesus is saying, let me fill it up. Let me meet that need. Let me satisfy. I'm the bread of life. You want me to sum up? You'll make this real simple what Jesus is saying here. You know what he's saying? He's saying you can't live without him. You cannot live without him. Don't get me wrong. You can survive without him. You can be successful without him. A lot of people are successful without him. You can experience pleasure without him. You can manage life without him, but you cannot live without him. The soul kind of life, the rich kind of life, the life you were made for. 
And guys, let's just shoot straight for a moment. Some of you, you're not living today. Not living. Of course you're breathing. Of course you're existing. You're surviving. You might even be successful at what you're doing, but your soul is growling. In fact, for some of you, the entire reason you're here today, the whole reason you said yes to the invitation to come to church, and maybe this is your very first time here, or maybe you've started coming back the last couple weeks or last couple months or in the last year, and the whole reason, and maybe you wouldn't have framed it like this before today, but you, you know this, is that you are hungry. You're hungry for something. And you've never talked with anyone about it. You just know it. And if that's you, your Savior stands here today and says to you, the search is over. I am the bread that you've been looking for. And here's the best part about what he said. This is the part that strikes me. You know the good news in what he said here? It's that word right there. Whoever. Whoever comes to me. Whoever believes in me. Whoever. Whoever. No stipulations. For who can have access to this bread of life? No entry test for who's worthy to eat. No hoops to jump over to prove yourself. Whoever. No one is too far gone. That's what that means. No one. No one is excluded from the table of Jesus to come to him and throw themselves onto his grace and to eat this bread of life. Man, I'm telling you, I remember being a student at the University of Louisville being 20 years old. And man, I'm telling you, I was starving. Starving. Empty. Living on crackers. And on the outside, accomplished. You wouldn't have known it. On the outside, successful. On the outside, put together. But my soul was growling for something more. And I'm telling you, I felt compelled by Jesus. I felt attracted to the one who saw in me what I could not see in myself. And it was that word right here, whoever, that was such good news for me. Because whoever is all-inclusive, whoever means you don't got to look the part to come to Jesus. You don't need to clean your life up first and then come to Jesus and eat. Whoever has been living on empty crackers, whoever has made a wreck of their lives, whoever feels like they can never be forgiven for what they did, whoever feels like they're in a hole so deep that they can never get out of it, he stands here today and says, I am here for whoever comes to me. Whoever believes in me. Are you a whoever? I know I am. And in this one statement, Jesus makes plain why he stepped into this world in loving pursuit of you. He came for your heart. He came for your heart. He came for your belief. That's what he said he wants you to do, right? Your trust. It's an invitation into a relationship. He says, I'm asking you to believe in me, to trust me, that I am who I say I am, not who others say but take me at my word, in my own words, but that I am the bread of life. I am the only one who can satisfy in ways that you need most. I'm asking you, he's saying, to leave the crackers behind and let me be the bread that satisfies you. Well, how do we do that, Jesus? How? Well, it means you're gonna have to consume Christ. Kind of a weird way of talking about it, isn't it? Kind of weird to consume Christ. And yet, we, we use that imagery, actually, in talking about anything that we throw ourselves fully into, don't we? Like we say, oh, I devoured that new series on Netflix. We say things like, oh, I ate up all that. Hey, thanks for sending that podcast. I ate that stuff up. So we talk about it in these ways, right? When we talk about this, is I'm all in with this. To consume Christ, the bread of life, is to throw ourselves fully into him and onto him, to devour his words and who he claims to be and what he desires to do in our lives. We consume him by clearing out time in our days to hear from him, to engage him, to talk to him, to read the scriptures and consume the words that Jesus spoke over us. And when you do that, you know what you'll discover? You'll find that what he said about you, he said he'll never leave you or forsake you. You consume that. You believe it. You take it in. He said before the foundations of the world were laid, he knew you and chose you. You are chosen. You consume it. Eat it. He said that the world, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I will be with you. You consume that. He said that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son for you. You are so loved, so sought after by God that he would cross the cosmos to win your heart. You consume it. We consume him by doing, by going directly to him and allowing him to speak for himself, discovering more of who he is and who he's made us to be. And I believe I believe that for some of you, even today, right here, right now, God has been orchestrating the events of your life in this season to get your attention. 
And he's ready to feed your hunger. He's ready to feed your hunger, to bring new life. And it's time for you to lean in this season, to be here at church, to be here. That's a way of consuming. To use the resources our church provides on our app and on our website, to begin to dig into the scriptures, to begin to dig into who he says he is, to consume Christ for the first time ever. That's, that's going to happen for some of you. I also know that some of you here, and you've followed Jesus for a while. It's been a long time, maybe. You are a life changed by Christ. You've just stopped consuming him somewhere along the way. You started settling again for some crackers. And the invitation to you today is to come back to the table. Just come back to the table. The bread of life is waiting. Are you hungry today? So hungry for meaning, for purpose, to know that you're loved. I want you to know that you have total and free access to the God of the universe. You have access to the God of the universe. That's not the question. The question is, do you have the appetite? Do you have the appetite? Because you have the access. And most of the people who heard him speak that day, they weren't ready for it. They didn't have the appetite for it. In fact, a lot of them walked away. As soon as after he, right after he said these words, a lot of them walked away too much. It's hard to walk away from crackers because crackers are easy. Flip it open. I'm done in a couple of seconds. And crackers is what everybody around me is eating. So a lot of people walked away. But there were a few that stayed by his side that day. And Jesus asked them at one point, he asked them a question. He says real simply, he looks around and he realizes that most of the people have walked away because they just wanted a free meal. But he's got these few people standing in front of him and he says, do you want to leave me too? Like everyone else has. And one of them pipes up, his name is Peter. He was always the first to speak. I love this guy. Peter pipes up and says something so profound. Listen to what Peter says. It's the last thing, we'll wrap up with this. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? Where, where else are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. We, what? Believe. We know that you're the Holy One of God. It's like Peter saying, Jesus, we've looked, I've looked. I've eaten enough crackers and I was still hungry. Where else could we go? I've had my fill of chasing other things to find fulfillment. I'm tired of being left empty. I want the bread of life. You know, you don't have to wait until you get all the answers to follow Jesus. You just have to have the appetite. And you can say today, Jesus, I don't get it. It doesn't all make sense to me. I still, I got questions, but I've looked other places and I've been left hungry. So I'm coming to you, the bread of life. So I wanna pray for us in just a second, but before that, I actually just wanna take, take us to take a moment right now and just sit with God. So would you just close your eyes and just right now, open your heart up a little bit to God and just ask yourself, what am I hungry for today? What am I hungry for today? Like soul hunger. And what have I run to, to fill that hunger? Are there any crackers that you've settled for when the bread of life is there for you? And if so, just ask Jesus right now. Just ask Jesus to be the bread of life for you. How do you do that? You just tell him you want them. No crackers. You just tell him what Peter said all those years ago. You have the words of eternal life, Jesus. Just tell him that. And just tell him, I believe. I believe. Jesus, we're so grateful that all you, all you want from us is a relationship. You just want us to believe. You just want us to trust. And Jesus, we're sorry for so often coming to you for a free lunch. We just want the thing you can give us when you're sitting there going, man, I wanna give you me. 
Jesus, I pray for those of us who are here today and our souls are growling a little bit. Our souls are hungry. Jesus, I pray that there would be some of us today who would be able to look back on this weekend and go, man, I met the bread of life. I met the bread of life that weekend. I began to consume Christ. Jesus, as we do that, as we lean into your words, would you fill our souls up to know that we have meaning and purpose beyond anything we could ever imagine because you created us in your image and have a plan for our lives. That we are loved beyond measure because you stepped in this world loving us so much you would give your life for us. And you've chosen us to follow you now. So we just reach out to you. And we just say we want you. It's all it takes. We just reach out to you right now and say, we want you, no crackers. We just want you, the bread of life. We want you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray.